Hi, I'm Dr. Sridhar Ganpati, a practicing pediatrician from Mumbai. Welcome back to the STEER channel, an educational initiative by my teacher, Dr. Y.K. Ambedkar. The topic for the day, lest you miss these cutaneous markers. The skin is the largest organ and most easily accessible for examination. And it gives you a lot of clues to systemic involvement. And these clues can be specific, they can be non-specific wherein you need to look further. You can have certain clues where you need to pick it up at the earliest so as to alter mortality and morbidity statistics. You need to look at clues that come from common sense. You need to look at clues that point towards malignancies and you have umpteen number of clues with each particular system that you take. So you can have skin clues for liver disorders, for renal disorders, for endocrinal disorders, for rheumatological disorders and the list is long. We are just going to be covering the important ones that you should not miss out on. So first let us take into consideration what are the skin clues that requires only common sense. So when you see an acneiform eruption, you know for sure it is an androgen excess and this could be coming from either the ovaries or the adrenal. When you have hirsutism, it is again an androgenic excess. When you have striae, you know it is a stretch mark because of obesity or it could be an endocrinal cause like the Cushing's. And when you have xanthomas, xanthilesmas, you know for sure that this patient must be having some form of dyslipidemia. Then there are a number of benign conditions which were considered to be benign in the past but any aberration from the benign condition like in the form of the extent of involvement and the alteration in the texture or the presentation should make you aware that, that there is something more going on with these conditions. So when you see a newborn with mongoloid spots which are pretty small, not very extensive in the lumbar and sacral area which is actually dermal melanocytosis which usually fades in the coming years you thought it was benign. But if you had extensive mongolo mongoloid spots involving the extremities, the back, they could be a pointer towards neurochristopathies. It could be MPS, it could be gangliosidosis, it could be mucolipidosis, it could be nymen pick, and the list is long. Same thing with seboric keratosis. Seboric keratosis almost looks like a dirty dripping from the candle wax and they are dark in color, black or brownish tinge and they appear and they are considered to be benign but when they suddenly appear in crops, it could be an indicator of an internal malignancy like an adenocarcinoma of the colon. Same way when you look at an abnormal whirl of hair on the head and you tend to neglect it but in a neurologically handicapped child with an abnormal whirl this could be an indicator of a migrational disorder of the brain. So this covers the ones wherein we need to use a lot of common sense and the ones which were considered to be benign. And in the benign category you should also look at the nest or the nevuses, melanoma. So melanocytic nevus, alteration of color, structure, border, texture. Yes, you need to think whether it is undergoing a malignant change. Same thing with sebaceous glands. When you have a sebaceous nevus, again you could have some derangement internally when they are extensive or they are growing in size. Coming to specific skin clues. So when I talk about specific skin clues, if I see a port wine stain 
in the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, which is a capillary abnormality, I need to peep into the eye for glaucoma as well as into the brain for an angiomatous malformation on the cortex or the leptomeninges. If I find a hemangioma in the area of the beard area of the face, a facial hemangioma, I need to look into the airway because a significant number of these kids would be having an airway hemangioma. If I see a tuft of hair in the midline along the spine, I need to look for spina bifida occult or some form of neural tube defect in the middle. If I find a low hairline, again, it could point out towards an aberration in my cervical spine structure. These are specific. And if you have an angiomatous malformation occupying a part of the face, you need to look inside the posterior fossa because it could be a part of faces syndrome. If I do find acanthosis nigricans, that dirty, velvety, hyperkeratotic uh, lesion at the back of my neck or in the axilla and the groin, it is a pointer towards insulin resistance and is also seen in obesity. But you can also get an acanthosis nigricans which crops up suddenly and which is extensive in a non-obese individual who is not on any drugs that can predispose to it. Like you could have mucocutaneous junctions, the palm and sole being involved, then it fits into a marker for internal malignancies. If you find the nasal cartilage, the cartilage of the ear dark in color, the child passing urine which turns dark black on keeping for some time, you think in terms of alcaptonuria, these children go on to get spondyloarthropathy. So what I'm trying to say is these are specific markers. Same way you can have a very big cafe au lait which does not cross the center with an irregular margin, a segmental cafe au lait which is associated with the McCune Albright syndrome wherein you have endocrine abnormalities, fibrous osteitis of dysplasia of the bone. So the list is long. I'm just trying to tell you common ones that we come across. Then let's go to the non-specific skin clues. When we get into the non-specific skin clues, we need to look further. So if you find a malar rash, which is so famous in rheumatological clinics, you need to understand it is actually a form of reaction to exposure to sunlight. And here you have the malar prominences and even the bridge becoming red. The nasolabial folds are not involved in SLE, whereas they are involved in dermatomyositis. In addition, you may have the heliotropsin and gotron's papules in dermatomyositis. And multi-system involvement in SLE like thinning of the hair, alopecia which is non-psychiatrical and multi-system involvement. Now if you have an itch, an itch is extremely non-specific but an intractable itch could be a pointer towards a liver disorder, uremia, a renal disorder. It could be just plain and simple xerosis of old age. But what I'm trying to say is you need to look further. Then coming to pigmentary disorders, you find a child with vitiligo, an autoimmune insult where the melanocytes are damaged. You need to look for other autoimmune conditions. Diabetes, you need to look at the thyroid, you need to look at B12 levels for pernicious anemia and the list goes on. And if you find oculocutaneous albinism, wherein melanin production is at fault, what is very important to understand is there are syndromes associated with immunodeficiency like Shediac Higashi and Griselli with hair color changes. You have the hermansky pundelak syndrome with platelet dysfunction. So if you have a child with oculocutaneous albinism coming from Madras, East India origin, you would work them up for platelet functional defects before undergoing any form of surgery, even a circumcision. So what I am trying to say is, you, if you categorize your skin clues under these categories, it becomes easy. 
Then comes the next category which is most important. You just can't afford to miss. You have a baby who's in the infancy, who's not been thriving well, he's got persistent vomiting, but what features hit you is a hyperpigmentation of the areola, hyperpigmentation in the axilla, hyperpigmentation of the genitalia. You need to think of congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Though nowadays we do the screening test in newborn, but you need to uh, think of this if it has not been done. The second condition that I did see in the last few months, which I did see and which uh, I think we should not miss, was a child with an erythematous rash, high-grade fever, non-remitting, with paradoxical crying that usually when you pick up these children, they stop crying. But this child continued to cry. In fact, used to cry more excessively. And this child, when I did look at the child's uh, redness, the, the exfoliation started in the perianal area. And you can easily mistake it for uh, drugs and the antibiotics that were given to this child and the diarrhea and the perianal excoriation unless and until you knew the history right from the beginning. And what clinched the diagnosis was the BCG mark. There was reactivation of the BCG which pointed towards Kawasaki disease. And you could put a full stop to all the coronary problems that this child could have had. Then comes a, a child with ataxia. Truncal ataxia, progressive, and by the time I saw this child at two years of age, this child had repeated respiratory infections. But when we examined this child, what was very significant was we did find some telangiectatic lesions on the sun exposed parts of the face and a telangiectasia in the eye. So, this was ataxia telangiectasia, and why this should not be missed because this child is going to be repeatedly radiated, x-rays, CT scans, and this child is prone to malignancies and chromosomal breaks. So a word of caution. So the earlier you pick it up, the better. And the last is the association with malignancies. You can have an acquired ichthyosis with Hodgkin's. You can have the sweet syndrome with leukemia. You can have a dermatomyositis-like picture before uh, the ovarian tumor makes its appearance. You can have a sclero-myxidoma with uh, uh, multiple myeloma. You can have an acquired cutis laxa with multiple myeloma. You can have palmar plantar keratosis and tripe palm with a lot of internal malignancies. So the skin will give you a lot of clues. It's like a window to systemic diseases. And this topic is more than skin deep. Thank you.